Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cyber Security Recruiter podcast. Today I'm joined by Christian Hayat from Risk360. Christian, how you doing, mate? Great. Thanks for having me, Thomas. I'm excited Good. to be here. No, no, thank you, mate. Just for the listeners listening, we've uh, this is second or even third time in a row. LinkedIn let me down. We were doing a live LinkedIn. I think there's quite a few people in the live room, and uh, Christian was in there. To be fair to you, mate, weren't you? But I wasn't. <laughs> hey, man, that's what happens when you try to rely on technology. So yeah. it's all good. We did our part. It didn't do its part. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But uh, yeah, so Christian is the CEO and founder of Risk Three Hundred and Sixty Boutique Cybersecurity Firm, coming out of Atlanta. Won various awards. Christian's also public speaker himself. So I've done you a little bit of an intro there, my friend, but I could never do it as well as you. So I think the best place to start is who are you and what have you been up to? Yeah, awesome. Christian, hi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Risk Three Hundred and Sixty. Just like you said. I started this company seven years ago. Before that, I spent my entire career in cybersecurity consulting and like a big consulting company, but I always had that itch to start a business. I always joked I didn't care if it was a taco shop or a coffee stand or whatever it was, but I wanted to start a business. Did my MBA, kind of used that as a transition point to figure things out for myself and Launch the Risk 360 off of that. And we're seven years in now growing. We do audits, we do pen testing, we do cybersecurity assessments. And it's just been a really great ride trying to build a culture and build something from scratch. But that's my background. Cool. Just so you know, Risk 360 is a damn sight cooler than a taco shop. You've already smashed your target. <laughs> so, yeah, very good. Um, all right, Christian. So, look, the bulk of my listeners some of it's my clients so business owners or like internal talent acquisition recruiters in large tech companies stuff like that but the bulk of my listeners are pen testers themselves most good pen testers i know if not every good pen tester i know is is obsessed with self-development what kind of self-development tips do you have for pen testers in today's market yeah i agree just our pen test team i think they're natural tinkers And I am too, just like always learning, always want to mess around with technology. That's just the ethos, I think, of the pen test community and anybody that's really technical. In terms of the things I recommend, hey, I think number one, I recommend just doing stuff you find fun. Because Mm -hmm. for most, I think for most of us in cybersecurity, pen testing and cybersecurity, generally speaking, tends to be a passion project, like something we do for fun as a hobby, but also Mm -hmm. a professional thing. So with that kind of balance, I think first and foremost is just do something that you find fun and interesting and you're passionate about tinkering with. And if you're lucky enough, you might be able to turn that into a money-making endeavor where it benefits your career. But if there's a pen tester out there that really wants to focus in on like, how do I use my professional development activities to get a better job or to build my reputation in the marketplace? I think there's a few things that I've seen really work. And then our team has done that stood out to me like when I was interviewing them and stuff. I think the number one thing is like building a portfolio. So what that means to me is that could be a website, that could be GitHub repos, that could be research, that could be talks and presentations, but some type of like curated portfolio where you can get some credit for all the hard work you've done and all the contributions you've made to the community. Because what I've seen a lot of technical people do is they're doing all that stuff. They're contributing, they're being productive members, they're not compiling it. So they can't tell people about it or the layman who's hiring them or interviewing them doesn't have a good way to understand what they're doing. So compiling all that stuff is a really good way to do it. For me, I started blogging. I've been blogging for 15 years. Risk 360 was actually a blog before it was a company. Hmm. Um, I, the Risk 360 was a URL available. I thought it was cool. It was like 360 <laughs> view of risk. Uh, so I started like a WordPress blog and was just blogging about stuff to teach me about cybersecurity and frameworks. And then one day I flipped the switch and made it an official website. But that paid off to me for me, I think. that got a little bit of credibility just because I had that history of professional development. The other thing I think is really good is it's just networking. I'm pretty introverted by nature. So like I have to work hard to get out there and talk to people and stay in touch. But I think networking is like working out in terms of no one ever regrets going to the gym. After you've been to the gym, you're like, oh, I'm glad I went to the gym today. Mm-hmm. Getting to the gym was hard. But once you did it, you're glad you did it. And I think that's how I feel about attending conferences or showing up to coffees and meeting people is I have a little bit of angst doing it or like I try to talk myself out of doing it. But after I do it, I'm always really happy I did. And that's one of those habits that I've tried to instill. But those are some of the things I think I'd recommend to folks who are considering how to level up their game for professional Mm -hmm. development. 
That's so true, that last point you said. Like when you, it's the same with doing this podcast or anything, anything that feels uncomfortable yeah. at the start, generally speaking, feels amazing afterwards. <laughs> it's all about sustained discipline over time. If you can just stick to something with a little bit of discipline and push yourself, you're going to become really good at that thing. And the reason you're going to become really good is because most people can't stick to something. Mm -hmm. So if you examine your life and you think about anything that you've done for five consecutive years, there's probably very few things that you've done consistently and regularly five years in a row. But if you can find that thing, I bet you're like top 10% at it. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just like that with pen testing or podcasting or writing. It's just establishing that habit and discipline and being terrible at it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're like, hold on a second, I'm actually getting good at this. And then eventually you're great at it. And I think that's just that's pen testing in a nutshell, I think. It's so true. It's so true. When yourself, the way you're talking there, Christian, and other business owners and CEOs have had on, I, I instantly related to recruitment as well because oh yeah the first year you're rubbish at it first two years no one wants to know you then when you've done it for so long this you just naturally get so good you can move so quick the quality you provide so good but it's not because you're you know you're superman or superwoman it is just because you've just been at it yeah you just, just get, you refine yourself you yeah. ditch all the stuff that didn't work yeah and then you <laughs> focus on the 20 percent that does work and you figure out what people actually care about and yeah. things just work out Definitely. And I really I like the first point as well. I, th I think these days, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts as a business owner on it and, uh, as well. But I honestly believe these days, if your resume, I, the way the phrase I always use, and I unapologetically use it again, but it makes your resume 3D. If you haven't got GitHub repos or stuff going online or stuff going on in the community, no matter how big or small, if you haven't got stuff within your profile or behind your resume doing that, I think employers these days, so that's a bit... That's a bit strange. Would you see that as strange if nothing was going on outside yeah. the resume? Yeah, for sure. Just I think pen testing specifically is such a show me profession. When we look at resumes, A, whenever we open up a pen test rec, we'll get 100 applicants. Mm -hmm. About 90 of them aren't qualified for the job. It's just someone who thinks pen testing is cool, so they applied for it, and they don't really know what that means. 10 of them are like clearly professionals, pretty good at it. And then of those 10, I think what really makes the difference is there's something that we can look at to, that demonstrates competence. And that's the 3D resume piece of it. Is there a GitHub repo? Do they have a YouTube mm -hmm. channel? Do they have a blog post? And then the way we interview too, we always do a case study and we have a lab. It's a very simple lab, but it pretty quickly weaves out who's capable and who is not. And we're huge on culture at Risk360. And one of the things that we judge people by is GWC core values. And what that stands for is do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? And then our five core values. And if someone's willing to do the lab, that kind of checks off the want it box for us and the capacity to do it. And if and we've had great pen testers who are like, look, I don't have to do a lab because I'm just, everyone knows I'm good. And they're probably right, but they're not right for us through 60 because we want someone who wants to be here, who's willing to put in the effort and we're going to be very respectful of their time. It's not something that's going to take days, it's an hour long thing. But, but to your point, that's the 3D resume piece. Can they prove out that they have the capabilities? Do they have uh, the GitHub repos, the work behind the scenes, showing they're passionate about this profession? And that really makes a difference. That's probably the difference between someone who can command almost any salary they want versus someone who's really struggling to get a job. Mm -hmm. It's just that time outside of work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, brilliant, because I think as well, especially on a consultancy basis, I was talking about this the other week, but it's, it really is a people business. You're dealing with end clients, you're dealing with multiple clients at the same time, different systems, explaining different things. You've got to have that. I think ever more so, every week, month, day that passes, I just think it's all becoming more and more relevant in the, in the yes, commercial world. Yes, that's the other side of the coin I didn't really touch on is pen testing. You know, very naturally, people think of that as a technical job, which it is, but the most important, what I have found is that as you move up in your career, you start to, the technical piece of it often matters less and the communication piece of it matters more because you either have to communicate to the team that you're managing, you have to communicate to your peers, you have to communicate to the clients that you're serving or the internal stakeholders that you're serving. And it becomes less about your technical ability to do the job, more about your ability to provide great service and great service could be to your clients or to your own team. I do this talk, this keynote talk, that's called The Art of Service. 
And I give it at cybersecurity conferences often because the context is like, what does it mean to serve other people? And I provide a framework to do that and share some anecdotes, but that really is like a separate skill. I think managing people and serving people is not just a separate skill, but often a separate career. You know what I mean? If you're pen testing every day and you're just head down, you're doing research, that's great work. And then you get promoted to management and that's not the same job. That is a very different job. Now you have to do one-on-ones with people. You have to do performance reviews. You have to hold people accountable. And I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the Peter principle. That's when you get promoted to your level of incompetence. So what okay. happens to people is that they're the best pen tester on the team, best consultant on the team, know all the frameworks, know, all the, know everything. And because they're so outstanding, the leadership promotes them to manager. They're like, you need to move up to manager. But they just, they didn't promote that person to a different skill set. They promoted them into a different career. Mm-hmm. Now that person mm-hmm. has to become great at people management. So that's one of the things I often say, make sure as you're developing as a pen tester, just flex those muscles too, those communication skills, those management skills, those service skills. Because there's not that many malware development jobs out there mm-hmm. where you can work into. There's a dime a dozen. Most folks mm-hmm. are serving people at the end of the day. It's interesting that because I'm probably going a little bit off topic here, but I'll do it anyway. So the best pen tester typically gets promoted, but the best pen tester might not be the best manager. It could be there's someone that's pretty average. But I presume the thought process there is they need to be pretty good to gain the respect of the team to manage other pen oh, testers and sure. stuff like that. So it's necessary for that good pen tester to what you've just said. Uh, I, really I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a two-way street. And what I mean by that is if you're a great pen tester and you're ambitious and you want to move up, A, you need to be honest with yourself. You owe that to your team, you owe that to yourself. Do I really want to get promoted into manager or do I mm-hmm. want to be an independent contributor that's just like a great pen tester? And there, there is a career path to do that. But the trap people fall in is management wants to reward you for being an awesome pen tester and the natural path forward is to now start managing pen testers. But they're mm-hmm. taking you out of the weeds that you love and giving you a management job. So I think the two-way street part of it is you owe it to yourself to self-reflect and be honest about Mm -hmm. what you want. And management owes it to you to ask if that's really what you want Mm -hmm. and specify what it means to be a manager. I've, by the way, I've learned this the hard way from experience. I've promoted so many great consultants and pen testers into management and they hate it or they fail (laughs) at it or I didn't help them succeed. I remember early on in my career, when we kind of first started the business, I was promoting all these folks into to management because they were they deserved it. They were awesome. But I didn't do a good job telling them what it meant to be a successful manager. I didn't do a good job training them on how to be a good manager. I didn't give them an opportunity to reflect on it and decide if they even wanted the promotion. Mm-hmm. Both of us just assumed that was the natural progression. And without the appropriate support system, it, it fails. Mm-hmm. And then they leave and they do a better job at the next place because they learn the hard way too. So we've really been conscientious about that at Risk360 about what does the year before getting promoted to manager look like? We have this thing called the Journeyman Program. It's a six-month program that you're with some peers at the company where you have an opportunity to self-reflect, think about what it means to be a manager, what your leadership style would be, what the roles and responsibilities of management are. It's a leadership development course. And then by the end of the Journeyman Program, you're either in a good place to become a new manager or you can opt out. Okay. Like I don't want to be a manager of people. I'd rather be like a deep subject matter expert. Mm-hmm. And that's been pretty good for us. Just giving people that six months to work with their peers and think through that. My business partner, CW, he was a captain in the army. He had a, his boss's boss who was named Rob Campbell developed this leadership de- development program where you had an opportunity to self reflect and he provided some coaching. So that's where we stole that idea from. We, Okay. It took some of the stuff he was doing. It's been really successful for us. Cool, cool. So the journeyman program, that's something going on internal. Is that online? Yeah, that, okay. But the yeah. of service, that's something listeners can access online. Yeah, yeah. There's, I'm sure yeah. there, there's YouTube videos of me giving that presentation. I'm sure floating okay. around. But uh, okay, we'll, we'll I'm actually that. doing that one at Rocky Mountain Information Security Conference that is in June. That's coming up a couple of weeks from this recording. I'll be giving that talk at that conference, actually. Cool. 
Okay, great. Wicked. Thank you, mate. And um, just a quick one. Do you know what I was going to ask you? And I don't, maybe it isn't of the way you've asked that question, but is it, if I'm a business owner listening mm. and I have promoted someone and I've realized it's a mistake, is that recoverable? Can I? Because obviously, if the pen test is seriously good, you don't want to be losing him or her. Can Can I reverse that and keep them, keep hold of them, retain them, and keep them happy? Is that possible? It's possible. Yeah, for sure. You can retain people. So not to be shrewd, but I think the best thing typically to do is to fire fast or quit fast. Like if, it's, if you get in there and it's clearly not a fit, and I think that's a careful balance, though, because sometimes you got to let stew for a little bit. You got to give it some time to figure things out. You don't be too hasty. But also, if you're six months in and it's like not a good fit, it's probably a good way, a good opportunity to part ways. And, and gracefully, too, like anyone who's ever left Risk 360 is like an alumni for life. We give as long as they were good to us and everything, we give them glowing reviews. We've even helped place folks. And I feel like that's just the right thing to do. Yeah. That happens very rarely because we vet people so heavily in the front end. So I think, first of all, it just be willing to leave if you need to. But second of all, it is recoverable. Like you can come up with a career plan that makes sense for people. You can place mm -hmm. people on projects that play to their strengths and help mm -hmm. them get to where they want to be. Also, if you're managing someone, part of your job as a manager and part of my job to, as I'm managing a team is to understand what they think they want, validate that, and then challenge them on it. Because maybe someone thinks they don't want to be a manager. And from my outsider's perspective, I'm like, but you're great with your team. They respect you. They enjoy what you're doing. Maybe the way you're defining manager is wrong. Maybe you need to shift the paradigm and be a different type of manager. And I can challenge their thinking. And that's part of that coaching and development relationship. If you're working for a boss, you owe it to your boss. And if you're a boss, you owe it to the people working for you to have those kind of conversations and develop them and try to save it. And I think as long as there's an open door policy and both people are committed to making it work and be honest and vulnerable and truthful to each other, there's always an opportunity to save the relationship. Yeah, definitely. No, thanks. Man. I think a really key thing you said there as well is really validate what you want, because I've seen that within technical sections within pen testing like people think they really want to do red team and why because you've never done it before so you might love it but you might hate it like you might if it's mobile where you know what whatever it might be i think really make sure, yeah really grasp the reality of what it is you think you love <laughs> i think a tendency is to overvalue the type of work you're going to be doing because at the end of the day everything becomes monotonous if you let it like if you're doing just network pen testing over and over again, you're like, I've done the same Active Directory network pen test over and over. I'm tired of that. Okay, that's a perspective. But guess what? If you red teaming for three years, you're going to probably find it's the same motions over and over again. And then you're going to be like, I want to get into malware development. That's where it's really creative. And then you get into malware development and you find out that gets monotonous because it's the same stuff. So I think the key is like developing your own career roadmap and then becoming a craftsman in whatever it is you're doing. If you're only doing network pen tests, we'll figure out how to be the very best one that you can do. Mm -hmm. And the areas that you can grow is maybe you start speaking about network pen testing. Maybe you start training other people how to do network pen testing. Maybe you mm -hmm. start a blog where you talk about your top 10 things that you see over and over again. And before you get tired of network pen testing, explore the other ways that maybe you can expand your own skill set within your expertise to become a true craftsman in that area before you jump to wanting to do red team. Yeah. That's just an example, but I agree with yeah. you. No, thank you, mate. Thank you. I think a really good thing you said there as well is growing in a particular area. If you're, these like really cliche sayings, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. If you're not growing, you're dying and all these things. And it's, I think it's so true. I think whatever aspect of the role it is you're doing, whether it's management, whether it's in the weeds on the tools, I think if you are growing and you've got that feeling of moving forward, I know from different things I'm doing myself at the minute with recruitment training and stuff like that, it's, the feeling of moving forward, it's revitalized my energy for the job yeah. again. Whereas if it's a podcast, I, right? Hmm. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> recruiting can be, uh, yeah. I've been recruiting for 10 years as recruiting, but guess what? I've never done a podcast about recruiting. That's, so you're becoming a craftsman as a recruiter, a brand new skill. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing in pen testing. Every career is like that, by the way, I found. It seems like no matter who I talk to, if it's a CFO, if it's a CEO, if it's an IT support guy, if they've been in for a decade, yeah. what they just have to, you have to redefine what your own profession looks like to be able to stay in it. Yeah, you do. Cool. Brilliant. Can you, I know you touched on it a bit. Can you tell us a bit about 
bit more about the types of work 360 do. I know you mentioned some kind of red team work, and I know that's something that people mm-hmm. love hearing about. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you elaborate. Yeah, sure. Risk 360. We have really three sides of our business. One side of our business is we have a GRC platform called Phalanx GRC. So that's just a platform for people to manage their compliance programs, their security programs. It's a SaaS app. So we have an engineering team that builds that. And the second part of our business is, I would say, really compliance related. So if there's a framework associated with it, like ISO 27001, SOC 2, NIST, you name it, Mm -hmm. we're either helping implement those programs or we're doing the audit itself. Like we do SOC 2 reports, for example. And then the third side of our business is more of an advisory piece. That's when we're helping build out security programs or doing security assessments. That's where our pen test team sits. We call Renegade Labs. And if you zoom in on pen testing, the type of work we do, most of our engagements, we have a healthy portion of the of the book that's like a compliance-based pen test. Like they're doing a SOC 2, so they need a network pen test. So it's like a two to four week pen test where we're testing apps or the network or something like that. We have all the traditional types of pen tests. So most of our clients are in the tech sector. So mostly large tech companies, meaning they probably have a product. They probably have a network. They might be remote. They might have non-traditional network setup. So it could be a network pen test, a web app pen test, mobile app pen test, social engineering, that the whole package It's really just depending on the client's goals. And then we have some engagements too that are more long-term. You can call them red team. You can call them continuous pen testing where the client has a whole set of missions and they want to do stuff multiple times a year or throughout the year to, to achieve some goals. So pretty good spectrum of types of work. The one thing that is, I would say, consistent with us, though, is almost all of our clients are tech clients. Some of them do have a traditional network, but almost all of them are cloud-based. One of the big three cloud providers, almost all of them have a product of some sort, which makes it interesting because they're always at the cutting edge of what they're trying to implement. Mm. So when you have a conversation with the CTO that's thinking about the cloud and thinking about containers, and by the way, they're thinking about chat GPT, it forces us to be like, all right, how would we do something like that? Rather than some big manufacturing company that has Windows 2000 with tons of open exploits. So it's just a little bit different dynamic because we're working with those tech clients like that. Mm. Yeah, cool. So you've got really nice spread, no danger of getting pigeonholed off into anything you've got a whole array of different yeah things. we're pretty pretty diversified I, I think everyone's probably aware of what's happening in the market right now in terms of tech layoffs a lot of the very well-known security companies and pen test companies have done some layoffs here recently we have been very fortunate in the fact that we've been growing really well through, through this whole thing there's a lot of reasons why i think we're still growing through all of this but it's just a fortunate thing for our business that we're still hiring pen testers through this and still growing and our clients are still doing more work with us not less so i just feel really fortunate to be in that place Mate, no that's brilliant and do you know what i i love hearing things like that and i'm seeing it my side as well because i've got certain clients that stop hiring altogether and i've got certain clients that are still hiring like crazy so i know and I know from what you just said there, and I know these pockets within cybersecurity that are still like on fire in a good way, like these like people yeah. that are really still moving forward. If I am a business owner listening, or let's say I'm a pen test listening, it is fascinating. Like what I know you said there's a number of different reasons why you're growing. What are they? <laughs> sure. So I think there's a couple of big reasons. One is I think we just do good work. That's hard to manage, but like we we have almost we actually don't have any churn with clients. We have had clients leave, but if you just look at our portfolio at year over year, we're doing like 110% growth. So we typically land at a client and grow the client, like almost no client leaves. So I think just that testament of good work, the types of relationships that we develop with clients make it make us more stable. So that's one reason. More macroeconomically though, is Risk 360, we're bootstrapped, meaning we we're own, we own ourselves. We haven't taken outside funding. We control our own destiny. The upside to that is that we don't have investors breathing down our neck, asking us to, to trim staff or making us hit profitability or growth targets. Everything that we do is self-enforced, which means if we want to take less profits to keep our people, we can do that. If we want to grow in certain industries because we think that's prudent, we can do that. So it just gives us a lot more control. The downside is we're not infused with millions of dollars of cash where we're throwing it away. And then, and lastly, is I think because we're diversified as a business, as certain sectors of the economy are being impacted by a down economy, since we're spread out, it doesn't impact us 
that bad because we might have a few clients that were impacted, but it's not our whole portfolio. And we don't have one client that represents like all of our revenue. So if they went away, we'd be in big trouble. And I know some peers in the industry, great businesses, but they, it happens. They fell in that trap or maybe they had one client that was a $10 million client and that went away and they had to do layoffs or they had investment and their private equity firm said, you know what, you need to break even. So that means you got to trim some staff. And those are just elements that, that we're not subject to. And I think it's been in our favor in a down economy. Yeah, no, thanks, man. The private equity, wh- whether it's coming from, I don't know, the money's coming, wherever the money's coming from, private equity or wherever, if you've, yeah. just a figure I'm plucking out of thin air, if you've taken on 200 million in PE money and the interest rates have gone up by 10%, you know, th- that's a lot of extra money. <laughs> so that, that money's yeah. costing a lot more than it used to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I'm not digging that, just for clarity. No. I'm not downing those, the companies who did. That's mm-hmm. a viable business strategy. It's fun. You grow fast. If you go back a year ago, people were saying Risk 360 was crazy because everybody wanted to give Risk 360 money. And it just seemed like it was a good time to do it. We resisted that. Fast forward to today, everybody's, yeah, look at all those companies that took money. They're regretting that now. But yeah, it's always easy to say in hindsight. So bottom line is like every business has risk and reward. Right now, I think Risk 360 is just benefiting from some of the prudence and some of the discipline we've showed in the past. Yeah, brilliant. And I, I agree, Christian. I think if anything, we're probably saying, I almost say any company that has taken on big investment that's had to lay off, that's what I've said to certain pen testers. I've said, look, to a certain extent, their hands are tied because they're getting told, you must do this, you must do this. So even as a founder at that stage, I would imagine yeah. there's only so much you can do. Oh, um, absolutely. You know, um, I can promise you those founders are like, their heart's broken when they have to do that. That's not an easy decision. It's easy to demonize like companies who have done that. And I'm sure there's some cases where they deserve to be demonized, but for the most part, those founders, they're really trying to do the right thing. And it's just an unfortunate situation. Hmm. Cool. All right, mate, moving on to, I know culture is a thing we've spoke about before. I think I checked LinkedIn once and I saw you and your colleagues sprinting through a load of mud on a weekend and I just thought, yeah. God, <laughs> when did this man relax? But uh, yeah, talk to me about culture and I know it's important to you. If you can tell us how you implement a good solid culture internally. Yeah. Culture is one of those things where I think everyone says they have culture. <laughs> it's like everyone brags on their culture, it seems. For us, I think, when, so when me and my co-founder named Christian White, when we started the business, I was always part of strong teams. He was a military guy. I was strong, part of strong teams. Even our friendship blossomed over similar values between the two of us about wanting to build a strong team with a strong culture. And for us, that was always number one over even like dreams of building a big company. It was just like, let's build something really cool that we enjoy being a part of. And if, and we felt strongly that if we did that, then all the financial stuff, all the growth would follow. And if it didn't, that's okay. Like culture first, like we just want to be in it for the enjoyment of it. And then it turns out if you want to grow a company, that's exactly how you do it. It has to be culture first. Like we started hearing from other founders. They're like, yeah, that's if that's the only way to do it actually. So I think some of it just comes from our own personalities and backgrounds and some of the first things we did was we came up with core values. So we have five core values. Everybody has core values, but we were like, how do we get these core values really inculcated into the culture where they mean something? So that's where we came up with the GWC core values hiring methodology. There's a business coach named Vern Harnish in a book called Scaling Up, another one called Traction by a guy named Gino Wickman. They both talk about how to hire this way. Preemptively, we were like, let's hire people who are good fits and who are also passionate about the same things and the same culture. Then we said, all right, what else can we do? So what else we did is we embedded in the performance reviews. So we do performance reviews twice a year. An element of the performance review is core values alignment. How are you meeting the core values? We train on the core values. So we're really serious about that. Even during the journeyman program I was talking about earlier, part of that was like, we want managers to be able to predict the decisions that we would make and also make decisions similarly to how we would make it. So we came up with a decision-making framework that also in, in a, embeds the core values. An example might be, do we fire this client because they're mistreating our people? We'll then take it through the decision-making metrics and that clearly doesn't align to core values. That helps drive a decision. So those are like, I think, the essence of how we've built culture. And then there's the things like on social media. So like we, we try to do something, one of our core values is grit. 
grit doesn't mean working long hours. It means like passionate persistence, kind of like we talked about earlier, sticking to something. So to hmm. represent grit, we try to do something hard as a team every year. So we, historically, we've done 100 mile relay race, we did a 200 mile relay race, we did a Spartan race, and, and a bunch of the team comes and you don't have to run the race. You might just be helping drive a vehicle or giving out candy bars to the team as they run it, but you can still participate in that struggle with us. So trying to build it into that way. We do swag. We fly the whole team in quarterly to do quarterly team meetings. We practice something called open book management where at each quarterly we present the health of the team, the financial health of the business and where we're taking the business and all that kind of stuff. So th those are just some of the things that we really mm -hmm. try to build and live, not just say we have core values, but live by those core values and make decisions in alignment with them. And I think it makes a big difference. So a lot of people, when they join the company, so there's this phenomenon called risk 360 therapy. I didn't invent this, but someone started telling me out of the blue, they were like, you know what, man, six months into the company, I feel like I was, I went through therapy. Like I just go back to my old self. I was like so depressed at my last job. And I was like, I was touched by that. I was like, man, that's such a deep thing to say. But within a month, like three other people said almost the exact same thing to me. And then I found out like the team was talking about this. They're like, yeah, it's risk 360 therapy. We talk about it. And I was like, that is really cool. It's cool yeah. that your team is talking about that. And and I guess that's culture. Like what is culture is living by that stuff. Those are some of the things we do. Yeah, man, that's really good. And uh, yeah, I was, I was going to, before you said that, I was going to say you are taking people on like a self-development journey, whether it's for themselves or it sounds like socially, you guys are doing a lot together as well. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, it's really good. And it, again, it ties back into that. I can see why it creates a good culture because everyone feels like they're moving forward. Then as a whole organization, you've got that forward momentum and then that yeah. trickles down to clients and atmosphere. And For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were to like survey our team, I can, with, great degree, with a great degree of confidence, they could tell you what our mission is, what our, like our long-term mission, what our mission for this year is, our goals, our core values. And this is the first company I've ever worked at. Like I've worked with other great companies, but if you were to ask me, what's the company's mission? Or what, do you, what are the company's goals for this year? I don't think I could recite them. I was just disconnected from that for whatever reason. Maybe I could tell you the core values, but I couldn't point back to like how we were living them. So it feels refreshing to just have like trying to build something that where everyone's on the same page about that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, definitely. And you know what? Long-term, I really see this kind of thing paying dividends in the market you said at the start of that question you said uh, yeah we just wanted to build a great company and then worry about everything else later and then you were like oh shit that, that's what you're meant to do and it's like, i've seen it work really well and we talk about why certain companies are thriving and certain companies are struggling and i do think this is a lot of it and where your morals are at where your head's at what's really going on internally i had brad on from frs secure and similar to you like they, they've got 100 staff they're ridiculously yeah. busy but when you look at what they're doing it's all the same type of stuff you just mentioned it's like they really genuinely care really want to do stuff for the community really want to help out and it's it just yeah. works it's a long-term play but it's the best way to operate definitely. i think it's like one of those counterintuitive things in life like you, you hear all those like zen sayings it's like if you want to push you pull like those kind of things but it's kind of like that with business it's like you give first you give abundantly you care and guess what the marketplace and your people give back. So it's just one of those things. It's so easy to fall in the trap of wanting to be selfish or just out of fear, trying to self-preserve or be very conservative or, and all that kind of stuff. And I don't blame anyone who feels that way because I think it, you're acting out of a little bit of fear. But then when you just pour in the people and pour into the marketplace and really try to give back and be genuine, that counterintuitive piece, the market gives back to you. There's a book by Jim Collins, and one of the sayings, I'll butcher this a little bit, but he basically says, hey, if you can harness a team's energy and get them rowing in the same direction, that's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. like there's, you can't stop it. If you get a dedicated small group of individuals, you can't stop them. You can look at the SIL Team 6. You can look at any small elite team. Like no, It doesn't matter who they're against. If they're all dedicated to admissions, you really just can't stop them. You might as well forget about it. So I think about our team the same way. It's like we're not a big team, but if we can harness all the team's energy to do that one thing, it doesn't matter what the market does. We can be successful. Definitely. I say you get the right group of people, yeah. It's, that what's, that's what creates a value in any company, that the right group of people all working in harmony. That's when it gets really exciting. On the core values piece as well, just before we move on, I think that's an amazing way to hire because – you're always going to get, if I talk in terms of pen testing, you're always going to get the amazing hacker that doesn't 
maybe doesn't fit in for this reason or that reason, but if you are just marking him or her against core values, no matter how good they are, no matter how suited they are to this particular piece of work or how much profit they could make, if they don't match the core values, you wouldn't hire them. And then that preserves the culture. So I think having yeah. that kind of matrix, that core values matrix to go against, I think yeah. really it's does. good for them too. Right. Because like ultimately they don't want to be at a place they don't believe in. So it's mutual. Yeah. It's a mutual thing. It's good for both parties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, mate. So I know hiring pen testers. I'm not sure you hired. I know you were hiring when we said, are you hiring at the minute or? Yeah, we have. So we just filled, we had three openings. We just filled two of them. We have one more of a senior pen test opening currently okay. open. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I know you, you hire on a, on a fairly frequent basis. If I'm a mid, if I'm any pen tester listening, what is your ideal profile? I know we've talked about different things in the community and stuff like that but what is your entire whole whole profile that you look for that i should aspire to if i'm a, if I'm a pen tester listening yeah just some of the basics so we're a hybrid workforce so we don't care where people live they need to be u.s based that's where most of our clients are but you can work remotely we do fly people in quarterly so they can be part of the quarterly meetings and be part of the culture there so a that's that in terms of profile of skill sets we talked about the core values we have this blog post called How We Hire at Risk 360. So if anyone's curious, they can go check that out and see what the core values are and how we hire. So first, measure yourself against those. Mm -hmm. And then the skill set. We always try to be very transparent in our job descriptions. So if you go to our website and look at the senior pen testing hire right now, for example, you can see exactly what skills we're looking for. This is a senior pen test role. So that's going to be someone two to four years in their career. So like early, mid-career, not entry level, and then good technical background. Like I kind of mentioned earlier, like experience with the cloud, of course, like blocking and tackling around network pen testing. Uh, so those are some of the basics that we're looking for. Cloud's massive at the minute, isn't it? <laughs> like I'm seeing it in my cloud. It's like <laughs> everyone needs to be good at cloud. Like it's just such a growth area, isn't it? I think so. It definitely mm -hmm. is for us. And I don't know if I'm biased because that's just our client base and our focus area. But yeah, basic cloud's table stakes at Risk360 because 80, 80 plus percent of our clients are cloud exclusive no i'm seeing it just for just so you know i'm seeing it like across the client that's like a role i'm working on now like a principal role like they've just got to at least have aws preferably either azure and yeah. gcp as well that's it's funny it's a necessity <laughs> this is how it was, i just saw an article and they were like it was i can't remember who wrote it but it was a group of people saying that maybe cloud infrastructure should be classified as critical national infrastructure because they're like, if you think about it, it's like a utility. Like all the Fortune 500 are using it. Every company is basically on one of the big three cloud providers. If anything happened to AWS, like a nation state mm -hmm. were to like try to mm -hmm. take them down in some way, it would be devastating to the economy. So like, it's almost critical infrastructure at this point. And that comes back to what you're seeing in the pen test world. Yeah, cloud is basically the de facto mm -hmm. skill set you need. Yeah, I did this. There's a chap, a chap called Timothy at Praetorian, and he, he literally all he did, his job's not a technical director, but he is just pen testing the cloud and he's very, very knowledgeable about it. So I did a full episode. I've not released it yet, but I did a full episode with him because I know that every I, I, either you're already on that journey or you need to be. So yeah, as a pen yeah. tester, so I think, yeah, it's um, cloud's it's, broad too because there's all the sub disciplines. Are we talking about like? Sec DevOps, where it's containers and infrastructure as code and that whole ecosystem, or are we talking about cloud infrastructure like as three buckets? So like, it's like even that has all these sub disciplines. Um, mate, even even just AWS's acronyms, mate, get me. It's like why can't you yeah. just call an EC2? Why can't you why you just can't call it a VM like everyone else does? <laughs> That's why I respect I, I do appreciate Azure for that reason, as they just call things what they are. Yeah. <laughs> so you can read it and you know what that thing is. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely, definitely keeps it uh, keeps it interesting. Okay, mate. So I was reading one of your newsletters quite a while ago. I was reading one of your newsletters. Can you tell us a bit more about how they can benefit the listeners? What they're all about? Sure. So if you just want an inside peek at the company, one of the things that we do, man, I think we've been doing this for going on five years now, almost since the beginning of the company, is putting out a quarterly newsletter. So internally. The newsletter serves the purpose of just like reflecting on what happened the last quarter. Because when you're growing this fast and and you're this young of a company, every quarter feels like a year. So what we started doing is putting together that quarterly newsletter to talk about big pieces of thought leadership, big events at the company, promotions, new hires, clients, that kind of thing. 
And they were like, you know what, we should just open this up to the public. And so we post them on the website. So if you just want an inside peek at the company and kind of see where we've been over the last few years, quarter over quarter, that's the inside baseball. You can learn probably about as much as anyone can learn about Risk 360 by reviewing those. Mm -hmm. So if you just want to check out the company before you, you know, try it before you buy it type of thing, I think they're really insightful in terms of what we're all about. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Um, Renegade Labs, I know you've touched on it. Can you tell us Can you tell us any more, more about that for pen testers this thing in? Yeah, sure. So internally, we call ourselves strange renegades. That's like our little internal cultural phenomena. And that comes from the book Scaling Up. I mentioned the guy Vern Harnish who wrote a book called Scaling Up. And there's this chapter about people. And he says, if you're really hiring good people, outsiders might think they're a little bit strange. And I highlighted that section. I was like, that's cool. A couple of pages later, he'll be like, they'll, be, they'll even be renegades in their industry. And I highlighted that. And it was like, I was like, oh, strange renegades. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So I just told the team about that. And I was like, look, strange <laughs> renegades is what we are. And then like it just took fire. But I was like, yes, we're strange renegades. So now it goes on T-shirts and everything else. As we were growing our pen test practice, I guess three, four years ago, we didn't brand them differently. We just, it was Risk 360, the pen test team. And I think we noticed that there was a subculture within our whole engineering team because we're building Phalanx, the platform, because we have labs, we have a certain degree of just engineering minded people and and they just have a subculture and we loved it and wanted to embrace it so we organized the, the physical office space a little bit different mm-hmm. one of our pen testers self-designed a little logo it was like an r and he was like renegade labs and we we're like dude let's adopt that that's really cool like strange renegades renegade labs so we started calling it renegade labs so that's the origin story of the lab story but the team is great we have the cto over there he was hired number four at dell secure works kevin so you're talking about OG who's just been in the industry forever, has an executive presence, has has led engineering teams, product teams, pen test teams, has been a buyer of all these services too. So just awesome dude, great leader. Corey, who's our practice leader over there, same caliber of individual, just really into the industry. If you look up if you look him up on LinkedIn and see all the things he's associated with. You'll see he's legit, like he's a contributor in industry, but more importantly, great leader, great person, cares about us people, like really developing him. He's one of those guys who, when he took being promoted to manager at some point in his career very seriously, and he's arguably a better manager than his pen tester, although he's a fantastic technical guy. And then under that, we have all (laughs) sorts of great guys that are like different specialties, web app, pen tests, they go to conferences. We pay for all the certifications. So those guys are on like basically continuous certification journeys that they work with their managers on. So all the professional development stuff, they have a lab that they try to cook up stuff, cool clients. So just a really cool subculture that does great work, has great clients. Our clients appreciate us. And then most importantly, I think it's just a sustainable culture. Like when you get in there, like one of our guys is going to a soccer camp with his kids. I'm like, all right, have fun. So there's just like plenty of room to live a life outside of work. Mm. And we're very cognizant of that because I think that's mm. part of balance. So solid culture, solid team, good clients they're working with, and then plenty of time for family and whatever else you're going to do outside of work as well. Cool, mate. Sounds good. Sounds like a really good self-development culture for the offensive guys as well. Sounds I think so. Yeah, that's what we yeah. try to create. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. I think as well on the kind of the balance piece and having fun outside of work, I think remote working is great, but I think since remote working, it's so easy just to – I don't know if you're the same as me, Chris. I'm sure a lot of people are listening now, but you just it just blurs in. You can just end up working. I can work so much longer when I'm working remotely, whereas before it would be like in the office, leave the office, and there was yeah. that separation. It's just not there anymore. So it is important to consciously think of it, I think. Yeah, I think we've tried to come up with some cadences and some rituals that I think help create some separation. Like when, like as a company – Every Monday at 10.30, 6 a.m. Eastern time, we have a company all hands. And it's like announcements, shout outs, that kind of thing. We do each sub team. So like pen testing has a weekly team meeting that they host it their own way. We do quarterly meetings where the whole team comes in. But I think these like these little routines that we've built as a company create time and space to have a conversation, which in turn lets you cut it off at the end of the day because there's a designated place to do things. So I think for whatever reason, maybe I can't even point, pinpoint it, that we've done a good job of creating some separation where people can create a home and mm. work separation. Mm. Cool. We can make, listen, it all sounds exciting. What are the, what are the future plans? What's coming up? What's happening for the rest of this year and next year? Yeah. Any goals, targets, anything like that? 
Yeah, I think I think over the so business is as such. You've probably heard this, and maybe some of your leaders, have, listeners have heard this too. It's like every success story was ten years in the making. This thing, this company comes on the scene, and they're like, "Oh, this new great startup," and it's, oh, they're ten, twelve years old. Yeah. And we've been around for seven years. We've doubled basically every two years, including this year. We're going to continue that same growth trajectory, but we're hitting that critical mass where growing is going to be significant. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll double the company over the next 24 months or so. I feel very confident in that. We're on a trajectory to do that. I think that's aggressive growth, but also manageable growth where it won't ruin the culture while we're doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I think bottom line is I think it's a the best time ever to join the pen test team or risk 360 generally speaking, because we're getting better clients than we've ever gotten. We're getting cooler logos. We're selling cooler types of engagements with better training programs, but it's also we're early enough in that journey that everyone that joins right now gets a say in that they get a say in what we become. So bottom line, I think there's nothing but upside in joining a company like this. I'm biased, of course. But I'm <laughs> listen, if, any, to come. if anyone applies and they haven't read that newsletter and they don't know those core values and they've listened to this, where have they been? In general, where have they been? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, mate. What do you think what do you think you're best at? What's three sixty best at, would you say? What is risk three sixty? So I'll tell you what we're best at. So we provide we're basically a technology enabled services provider. And what that means is there's a lot of companies that do pen testing. There's a lot of companies that do audits or can do a security assessment, but we do it platform enabled. So a lot of times what we're doing for customers is we're bringing a full blown managed service to them. So if they wanted to, and many of them do, they could outsource their whole GRC or their whole security function to us. So like they don't necessarily need a CISO and a security team and a red team internally. We could, we have a playbook and the technology and the team that can just do that for them. So what we have companies that, for example, have a CISO or a small security team. They have a ton of compliance requirements. They need a red team. And they contacted us because they just want a security assessment. And then through talking to them, they're like, hold on a second. You mean you can become part of our team? And we can bring that playbook for them. And we're increasingly doing that more and more. We call it compliance as a service or GRC as a service or whatever you want, just as a service. Mm -hmm. And I think we're one of the few folks in the market that are uniquely poised to do that really well, which is cool because you'll have, you know, part of our labs team with part of our GRC team with part of our VSISO team all working together on the exact same client. And that's a really fun place to be because that's not a transactional pen test where I do it for four weeks and I'm gone you're part of the strategy yeah. of the company at that point. Yeah. And I think we do that better than anyone. That's probably the future of our company, actually. Yeah, brilliant. That's a proper partnership. That's not a transactional relationship. That's exactly. a proper, yeah, yeah, client vendor. Part. Yeah, they're, and they're cool, like it. And it sounds like there's a lot of opportunities for this. So when you meet a new client, there's so much that you've got a lot to, to explore with them. Uh, yeah, yeah, for <laughs> yeah. sure. For, a, we use the word, the bond of joint discovery. Okay. Right. When we're talking to a client, they're like, <laughs> they showed us the tip of the iceberg and then we start asking questions and there's the iceberg underneath and then we're off to the races trying yeah. to figure out how to help the company. Cool. Brilliant. Okay. What qualities and attributes do you think make up an absolutely exceptional pen tester? So outside of Risk 360, I think it's just like curiosity and sustained discipline over time. So if you find yourself passionate about pen testing, you're naturally curious, you're going to find rabbit holes and explore them. And then you have the discipline to keep doing that for a decade. You're going to be a great pen tester, no matter what your IQ is, no matter how naturally technically inclined you are. If you can do those things, you're curious and you can do that for a long time and you have the discipline to keep doing it. You're going to be great, period. And then if you look at it at risk 360, I think the additional piece is the core values piece. If you're curious, you're disciplined, you're going to do the right things time over time and you're in line with the core values. You'll be also be great at risk 360. I think as simple as that though, do it well for five years and you'll be yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, brilliant, mate. I think delete Instagram or whatever it is and stop looking at these people that say you can do it yesterday. It's just not real. Like, we, you know, it's just like this instantaneous culture. It's, I think the, the patience bit is key these days. Yeah, you can start. You can definitely start. You can become decent really fast. But it's like anything, it's, I would say like golf or something, any sport you play, it's like you can learn the fundamentals in a few sessions and enjoy it. But if you want to become Tiger Woods, <laughs> that's a journey. Yeah. And I think most people aspire to be great at what they do ultimately. Hmm. And that is not fast. That's going to be sustained discipline. But if you're willing to do it, like we talked about earlier, 
you're, you'll be among the few who are willing to take that path and you'll emerge one of the best. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, mate. And Tiger Woods is a great example because it's not linear success. Look at his, it was yeah. up and down to say the least. Yep, <laughs> yep. So yeah, cool. Okay, mate, uh, I know I promise you an hour, I say this every week and I always keep people longer, so I'm not doing too bad, but you've got your own podcast. Can you tell us a bit about that, what people can learn from it, where they can maybe catch yeah. a few episodes? Sure. If y'all want to, just generally speaking, I think there's two really great ways to engage with Risk 360 and me personally. For me personally, it's LinkedIn. I try to be disciplined about putting content out and linking yeah. back to all the resources that we do. I also try not to be like a gaudy social media influencer. I try to be authentic and actually put useful content out. I don't know if I succeed in that. But that's why I you try. Do, but I do post. You do. You do. You post all. I see. It's the same time every. Like I see it all the time. I'm like, yeah, oh, there he is. <laughs> it's this one, man. I, <laughs> yeah, eight, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's eight thirty-five a.m. Eastern time every weekday. That's a great way to engage with me. Sometimes I get down in the dumps and I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to keep doing this. So if you hear this and you send me a note and say, hey, I appreciate your content, it'll give me that fuel I need to okay. keep going. But that's the way to, to engage with me. The firm, though, we put out several videos a week on YouTube, including the podcast that we do. If you go to our YouTube channel, just look up Risk360 on YouTube, you'll see it. There's a playlist on pen testing. There's a play playlist on GRC, building security programs. There's series out there. So we put a lot of stuff out there because we're passionate about it. So if you just want to check us out and see what we're all about, you'll see my face. You'll see other team members putting out videos and good content. And also maybe learn a thing or two if you're trying to get mm -hmm. to speed. Yeah, cool. What we'll do, Kristen, as well, is everything you've mentioned, like YouTube. I know you've mentioned the your talk as well. We'll put everything in the show notes. So we'll get all, awesome. the, link, all the links together when we put the pod out. Uh, thanks for that, buddy. And what type of attacks are you seeing right now? Anything particularly interesting? I get there's probably certain stuff you can and can't mention, but I always think a great way for pen testers to learn is to reverse engineer attack paths. Is there anything educational or entertaining, kind of interesting that you're seeing? So bottom line is, I think the most common stuff is the stuff everybody is not new. I just did a talk. So one of the things about our platform Phalanx is we log all of our findings in there, assessment findings, as well as pen test findings. So I can search and see just what's coming up. So I did a talk on that recently in Nashville where I just said, here's the trends we're seeing. And the trends haven't changed for years. Like it's mostly the same types of things. So if you're talking about pen testing, it's, if there's shadow IT, my guys are going to find that and they're going to exploit it. If it's a traditional Active Directory network, they're going to test all the common vulnerabilities and they're going to get in and it's not segmented, so they're going to move laterally. If it's a web app, it's like the same things that come up. So nothing earth shattering. One, one slight trend that I'm seeing is like Internet of Things devices. So we've had a couple pen tests where we'll test a listening device or some avert, not Alexa, but something like that. And those things are a nightmare <laughs> in terms of just the yeah. vulnerabilities. Like you can just... Like there's hard coded credentials into AWS and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and just from our small sample size, I suspect that's probably common. I could probably take any device from anyone and would have those same types of vulnerabilities. So that's interesting. I know IoT is big, especially in the government space with sensors and stuff. So I suspect based on my small sample size, that's a trend. And then we talked about cloud, just like common misconfigurations all over the place. We can get to those all day long. But those are some of the like anecdotal trends. Fishing, of course, like social engineering, that's been around forever, but still fruitful. Like you can still trick people. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the trends, I guess. Not new, but still very relevant. Yeah, no, thanks, mate. If I just relate that to someone trying to steal a march on their self development gains or someone new into the market, how they can make themselves stand out. I think for anyone listening, I think certainly cloud and IoT, and I'm seeing like a lot of hardware hacking stuff as well. I've got requirements myself for that at the minute. That seems to be like a, an area that's... I think really that's a niche area too. There's is, some demand yeah. for it, but not a lot of people that are in it. Yeah. But you can't go wrong. Learn Active Directory, the network, traditional network pen testing, learn cloud, go spin up an AWS, Azure, and GCP environment. If you do those two things, like you're going to be very marketable no matter yeah. what. Yeah. And if you're trying to get niche, choose your niche. Maybe it's hardware and stuff like that. But yeah. Cool. Brilliant, mate. I think you've covered this anyway. I think you've covered some of this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. The main theme across kind of my LinkedIn profile on the podcast is self-development for pen testers. Can you tell me and the listeners, if there was to join Risk360, how their self-development will be taken care of and any other tips for self-development in general? Yeah, I think we talked about a lot of it, but some, I would say that we 
generally speaking, I would split it into two buckets. There's a technical development area, and then there's a leadership development area, which we try to focus on both those areas. So on the technical side, there, there's some fundamentals, like go get your SCP. If you don't have that's going to be good for you, good for us. You need to do that. Cloud training. So go learn the cloud if you don't know that stuff. If you're looking for security fundamentals, maybe go get like CISP. So I would say there's some security fundamental training that if someone doesn't have that stuff that we encourage and we pay for that kind of training. There's also other more specialized training, like you need to be really good at web apps or something. So that'd be part of a professional development plan that you'd work with your manager, say, look, I really have this expertise, this inclination, this is the type I'm working, work I'm doing, let's go get that specialized training. So it's kind of like a pyramid if you think about it. The bottom of the pyramid is your fundamentals, OSCP kind of stuff. It's table stakes to be in the game. You move a little bit up the pyramid, that's your specialization, where it's like based on the work I'm doing and my passions, I need some specific training. So get those certs and that training. And then there's the informal training in terms of having a lab environment or just experimenting among, amongst the team, and we'll do that. So that's kind of the technical side of it, all paid for. Uh, we have a professional development plan with your manager that you work through. And then there's the leadership development side of it. And that's, I described earlier, the journeyman program. That's our formal training program. And then the informal stuff like providing time and space to consider going to conferences or doing a talk or learning how to manage someone or maybe even getting official certification around management rather than technical. Mm-hmm. But that's typically like a little further in their career. Maybe you're a couple of years into your career and you start working on that stuff. But we, if you ask my co-founder, Christian White, he would say that Risk360 is a training organization, okay. not a security company. So <laughs> that's, how we, that's how seriously we take it as we really try to train folks. Yeah, good, mate. Listen, that's not a bad place to finish that. Is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't, mate? Or have we covered everything? Or No, man, this was fantastic. Thank, yeah, thanks yeah, for man. what you do in the marketplace, helping pen testers. I think it's awesome. And if anybody is listening to this, like I love to connect. So feel free to reach out. Don't be bashful. Brilliant. Christian, thanks for your time, mate. And I'll see you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Cheers, buddy.